Okay. Do we, looks like we have pretty much everyone here. I think I get things rolling. All right, uh, let's begin the show. <laughs> Welcome to our, our neighborhoods virtual reception celebrating the works of Elvira Dayal and Emily Guy. For those who are unfamiliar with our neighborhoods, it was initiated in 2018 with the intent to bring art into unexpected places for spontaneous artful discoveries. These spaces aren't your normal, formerly uh, white wall galleries, museums. They are more connected with our daily lives like cafes, restaurants, activity centers, community centers, hotels, you name it. <laughs> it's been an ongoing pleasure to connect with small businesses and commercial spaces to activate their underutilized walls with locally made arts. Tonight's reception is all about our artists, like I said, Elvira Dayel and Emily Guy. They are exhibiting at Counterpulse, which is 80 Turk Street in the Tenderloin District. Uh, and they are, their work is up until August 19th. For those who want to see the work in person, you may contact Counterpulse and we'll give you those links in a little bit. Um, so before I dive into the work and discuss with the artists on their practice, I would love to bring in Justin. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, my name is Justin Ebrahimi. I have the sun in my face at the moment. Um, I am the Director of Communications and Advancement at Counterpulse. Counterpulse is a performing arts organization based in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. We have multiple artistic commissioning residencies, a neighborhood arts program. We're also a rental house and there's a lot of different ways to get involved. So especially now as we're gradually reopening and doing more live arts programming. Uh, I'll also do a shout out that we have two open job positions. So I could chat in a link after and uh, share those. And of course we have a visual arts program. So we have been lucky to partner with ArtsFans Arts and Neighborhood Program for several years now welcoming visual artists to exhibit their work on our space, which is a three level gallery space. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about our curatorial process. So what we look for when we're reviewing the applicants is look, um, alignment with our general curatorial values of social relevance, um, innovation of traditional art forms and selecting site specific works. And we also look at how these works fit curatorially with the rest of our season of, of events, whether, whether they are live or virtual, um, just looking for paralleling themes and elements that really, you know, when the audience comes into the space, they will see these visual artworks before and after the performance. So we, we consider that. So when we're looking at Emily's Guy's works, who's Emily Guy's work, who's uh, uh, they're ex uh, exhibiting work on the upstairs and mezzanine levels of our building, we were drawn to the like fabrications of human forms in a way that felt isolating and the sense that nature is peeling, like it's peeling quite literally like wallpaper in this empty space. Um, we felt we we're resonating with this uh, idea of a collective space of place and intimacy um, as uh, Dial was saying, oh, sorry, I think I'm confusing my notes. Um, but the, the work is concerned with objects of absence and, and people waiting our return, which felt really res resonant um, in the pandemic. And also spoke to us in like uh, the empty building. We were waiting with the return of audiences who fortunately in the past couple months did come to Counterpulse to see these works with some other live performances. Um, for Elvira Dial, who is displaying work on the downstairs level, we were struck by the deep contours of human form. Um, displaying humans who are cuddling, dancing, but yet also alone, which also really brought out pandemic vibes as we're all looking for gathering and intimacy in our space, in our community. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that this exhibition is really perfect to, uh, to, to begin as, as in the pandemic and as we're so slowly reopening our space and having a spring and summer season of events and performances. So we do have some exciting work happening and later in the summer and the fall. So feel free to check out our website and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Justin. Is there any current show right now that can relate, oh, sorry, correlate with the artworks or not quite yet? I would say yes, but it's virtual. <laughs> we, okay. we do have another virtual showcase of like, uh, 
film, dance films and other performances of uh, queer emerging Bay Area artists that I definitely feel would resonate. These films were created over the past year, year and a half. Um, but we're, we're gonna be a little bit quiet for the next month or so. No worries, I totally understand. We're all getting our feedback on the ground as we reopen and get all our creative energy back, at, back into shape. So I'm excited to see what future endeavors Counterpoles has to offer and any, and uh, I'm excited to hear about your curatorial program. Maybe as an artist, I could probably apply. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And, fantastic, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna be moving on to our first artist of the night, Elvira Dayal. Oh, that's my mistake. Hi, Elvira, how's it going? Hello, good, good. Great. Excited about, about this talk. We're happy to have you here. Um, we're gonna dive into your work. Uh, Elvira is a artist who creates quietly disturbing yet relatable soft pastel drawings. Elvira, your work is very concurrent and it relates to our collective trauma. What do you hope viewers feel when experiencing your artwork? So when I'm thinking about collective collective trauma, I, I kind of, in my mind, it, um, sort of uh, refers to maybe collective memory. I mean, all of our traumas are coming from different um, origins, different place, and our sort of collective experiences. And, um, and there are a number of notions in, in my work, uh, but one sort of pretty large one is that even though I'm very present in my work, I don't make it for me. Like it's it's not it's it, most of the times it's not it's not for me. It's um, uh, somehow guided, and um, there's always sort of this desire to um, address the collective struggle. And I think when when uh, that comes through the work, like people relate to it um, uh, on on a, an, uh, it, the work communicates kind of a, almost on a higher level. Um, and the viewer establishes, uh, I think, a, an emotional connection. Um, my, my work is specific and a lot of times it's very general. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this, this piece, uh, for example, a, a lot of the work that's installed in, in Counterpals currently, it's very figurative and uh, the figures are very resolved. Um, in terms of anatomy and proportion. Um, and this particular piece, uh, it's called uh, Poetry Reading Poetry. Um, and two figures sort of, they, they overlap. Um, and uh, the, the hair, the, the green that weaves through is kind of this connective, um, connective tissue that kind of ties, it's, it's the background, it's the hair, it's, um, the, the connection, I think that the, uh, yeah, I, um, I love this piece. I love the contrast of the green and the red that they really pop out, um, from that really neutral gray background and there's the intersecting and you don't know, like there's abstract shapes that kind of highlight the figures, but then also push them away. So there's a push and pull and like, I'm intrigued by the beautiful hands holding the book and then the, the hair flowing. Um, and I really wanted to dig in on your color choices. You know, you will have lots of grays, like I said, but you really push for this really beautiful red. And it, is there a motivator uh, for that color choice? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's been, you know, sort of the, the reds, the grays and the grays and a little bit of greens and maybe other colors, I mean, the, that has been a preferred palette and um, kind of a love affair, I guess, for, for a number of years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and th there, um, there's maybe, you know, one main reason and there are also um, multiple other reasons for it. But um, I, uh, I grew up basically with an, with an abundance uh, of that color. And I grew up in Soviet Union where sort of the propaganda machine used uh, red for symbols large and small and uh, ruby red kremlin star um, 
tiny little stars uh, with the head of Lenin for the elementary uh, pins uh, for the elementary school kids. And um, the, the crimson red ties for, for the uh, middle schoolers. And there was the red uh, um, flag-like pin for the um, uh, high schoolers. And then mm -hmm. there was, uh, um, I mean, for the um, major, call them high holidays of, of the Soviet Union, the uh, May 1st uh, uh, Laborers International Day and um, uh, World War II, May 9th, uh, uh, World War II and um, victory. And the red was literally like the color red was just overflowing in the in the country on the parades, and it was the fab the red fabric would stretch for miles, and people would wear these red ribbons, and um, everything was just like literally torn in red. And it's interesting how throughout my use of red, initially it was only reserved for in my work. It was only reserved for figures, and then I mean. I, subconsciously probably kind of drifts you know outside and becomes right it becomes the land is the is the red and it kind of cuts a clear horizon line um i mean there's there's uh, i guess there, there's a lot of red in, in my mind but there's one um as as i was you know kind of thinking about um this question uh, there's one art piece that's always on my mind and it always has been in my mind since I was probably 12 or, or 13. Um, and that's a piece uh, by Petrov Vodkin. He's a, he's a, a Russian um, pre-revolution, pre-1917 Russian revolution and kind of like pre-Soviet era uh, artist, even though he was, he lived long after, but uh, his main and really interesting work occurs in that sort of uh, tumultuous period. And there's this one piece that he made that made a huge impression on me, um, and it's called uh, "A Bathing of a um, uh, of the Red Horse," and it's uh, you can imagine it's a it's a huge huge um, uh, painting uh, with uh, a red horse uh, mm -hmm. being ridden by a nude boy into um, into a lake, and they're basically going for a swim. Uh, but but this and at the time when I was little, um, it struck me as something unrelatable. Like I couldn't relate to the sport. But even though it just kept on following me for for years, it's, it's always kind of always on my mind. Um, and now that I'm thinking and analyzing it, uh, it's probably the sort of the Russian Russia is that is that horse, the lamb, the the the, the struggle, the bloodshed. I mean, even mm -hmm. even still, it's causing a lot of bloodshed. But even within, it's it's. Uh, um, within the country, the, the government is still um, uh, um, persecuting uh, a lot of the individuals. There's no freedom, things like that. So the, the land is so saturated, I guess, with, with red that it kind of permeated into <laughs> into into my mind, into my um, into my art. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the affair with the red. I think <laughs> that's my yeah. Best part. <laughs> think. Um... Fantastic. I really love to, to hear about like the the birthplace of that love affair of color and that red and how that really relates to your upbringing and where you're from. Um, and that really connects me really well. So thank you. Um, another thought provoking question is all about the alternative realities that you're creating. Um, as you see through this title, my neighbor's hedge is dripping from the sky who I, I would not have thought of putting hedges that are dripping like stalagmites, you know, um, and I love it. It's very cool. And this is an alternate reality and like a parallel universe in, in a way. Um, does that, has that altered your own perspective at all as an artist or in your own um, space in the real world? You know, Every art piece um, kind of takes hold in something. I, I mean, I think, well, this particular piece, uh, th these two pieces, this is kind of a diptych. Um, mm -hmm. it, it takes hold in, in something absolutely realistic. And when I tell you this, you probably would be laughing. Uh, or um, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe a situation where we're sitting having a barbecue with our friends in their backyard. And they're discussing the most mundane things, like 
uh, he wants to, the, the host, he wants to um, change the, the fence, you know, of his, uh, um, that surrounds his, his uh, house, backyard. And he has three neighbors, a neighbor in, in the front and a neighbor on the sides. And he approached uh, his neighbors and he's telling them, you know, would you like to participate in changing the fence? And so the two neighbors are okay, but this one neighbor, um, he's like, you want to change it, change it. I don't know, you know, but as long as you don't touch my trees and as long as you don't, you know, disturb the bushes. And what, um, and so this, <laughs> this idea of this, uh, my property lines, like these real but very arbitrary kind of, you know, divisions that exist, uh, you know, on a very small scale in, in our backyard or their backyard, or, uh, but on a larger scale in our countries or, I mean, we're constantly, right? Uh, and so, I mean, for me, this was like, you know, a reality, but it was a, it's constantly an alternate reality <laughs> in a way. And it, so, uh, this is basically that hedge that they were discussing and an issue with. It was literally, it, it felt like it was kind of altering our mind. Yeah, we, we can't find okay. common ground. And yeah. mm -hmm. easily, a lot of times, sometimes at all. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, some things don't come easy. So yeah, we do create this kind of, you know, alternate view of how we look at, at things, um, at relationships. <laughs> And isn't that just it's a just, microcosm? Just, what's that? That's a microcosm of border issues and and whatnot, and like it's right. just like a tiny point. Like it's just my backyard, but this happens all across the globe because humans were territorial, were greedy, blah blah blah. Yeah, so it's interesting that you kind of pinpointed to uh, a moment in in your history. Y yes, and. And I mean, all these figures, right? A lot, a lot uh, in my work, these uh, isolated figures, um, and yeah, they're sort of kind of occur, right? They are unrelated. They, they, they don't relate to the objects. They're just kind of there. Um, but of course it puts you, you, like it puts the viewer into that work, right? Like kind of the viewer can relate to the figures. So mm -hmm. you, ultimately start reading the scale, right, mm -hmm. of these edges <laughs> that can't really grow upside okay. down. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? Yes. I actually have a couple of questions for you, Elvira, from the chat. And um, I'm going to start off, kick it off with um, Justin at Counterpulse, actually, um, asks, how do different cultural understandings of nature and landscape inform your work, if at all? um what's how do i differentiate what's the word how do i how do different cultural understandings of husband. nature and landscape inform your work if at all yes very very much so i mean i'm, I'm an immigrant as, as i already said um and this nature this landscape literally the the environment is so different um uh, definitely, uh, uh, I, I come from um, south, uh, south of uh, uh, Ukraine, and um, very woody. Um, I, I mean, I, I love this, the, the contrast uh, of the sort of the California rolling hills, like you drive on five or or you drive east, and it, it's it's amazing, and the sort of bare. I mean, it's not barren, but uh, but it looks, you know, free, free of, let's say, growth. Um, and I think a lot of my barren landscape is probably somewhat influenced um, by by that this kind of landscape. Um, but cult uh, cultural environment. I mean, you can't. Com if we're talking cultural environment. That's. <laughs> I mean, it's South and North Pole, right? Like where <laughs> where I grew up. I mean, the country that is there now is very different from what I left 25 years ago. Um, but of course, I mean, uh, the things we grow up with, they, they stay with us forever. I mean, the, the red horse bathing is, <laughs> you know, and uh, certain examples, I mean, it's just like, um, you, you don't, I mean, you don't know, they want to fight it to, to change it, but it's just like really informs um, how, you, how you 
view. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of conflict. I think I, I come uh, from a country where there was never this sort of, um, there was a common culture, but there was always this uh, sub, subcutaneous struggle right until it was actually not subcutaneous right like it, it you know erupted and uh things changed dramatically um but yeah yeah but i mean i think there's a lot of it uh very different struggle here um different and the same i mean it's right it's um yeah so it, uh, yeah a lot of things of course they they make it into the work Definitely a lot to process and think about. I know that I know that was not an easy question, but I have one more question for you, Elvira. Are you ready? Your uh, fellow exhibitor asked Emily Guy. She asked, and if Nick, maybe you can um, circle back to some of the pieces with the hedges in it. Yeah, you got it. This, this this question is specific to that. Um, Emily comments: the texture in this work on the hedges is lovely and feels like a different treatment of the material. I'm interested in how you came to use pastel. Mm. I get this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I should embrace it or like literally hide from it. <laughs> um, I think discovery of pastel was, in, was a total accident and it was a momentary um experiment and i was just like oh wow it can do that <laughs> um and well the textures that's kind of a more of a conceptual question different from the material itself i mean you can use pastel people paint paintings that are photorealistic with pastel you can use it uh in you know just like you use paint. I don't use pastel that way. Uh, and that is why I use pastel and not paint. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, pastel is just like, it's all pigment, you know, when I, I'm blonde, when I use a lot of red, um, like my hair gets literally red and pink. So it's just like, it, it's, it's uh, kind of pulver. I mean, it, it's in the air, it's dusty. It's, um, yeah, it's probably not very healthy when you, when you uh, use a lot of it. Uh, but it's all pigment, like you, you right? Like you're, you're in it. it, it's it's kind of physical in that way. Uh, but it also produces, uh, the way I use it, like absolutely solid um, uh, color fields. And I, I love that. Um, that's what mostly like attracts me. I guess you could achieve that in paint as well. But then you would see the brush strokes, and I don't like that. <laughs> so I, I, a lot of times I want to remove myself from from the work. Um, I, I don't know in that way, but I do put so like these hedges are rendered. Some I mean yes, there's textures somewhat maybe realistically like you can you know maybe even tell a certain plant uh, from it. So I do like to throw that in once in a while, like I put a kind of like a, a allusion to a three-dimensionality of the piece. So, yeah, I just kind of like to play with that. Um, that's my my mind game. I mean, it's kind of like keeping things simple and mm -hmm. then doing something else to it. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, I definitely see, that, see that in your work where there is large fields of, you know, just flatness um, yeah. and then you bring in some uh definition um like with the hair here or there's the line work where you see that the head and the in the arm and but everything else is kind of flat so um it's just a beautiful rendering uh of, of pastel so yeah like like in those. these other pieces um with the male figures like i i started experimenting mm -hmm. Uh, with this uh, light source, like you can see these, mm. right? Like you have, I mean, it's 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 a light source, and it actually uh, started with that um, with that diptych that we talked about earlier. Um, the guy sitting at the bottom, he's holding an iPad. I mean, kind of, and then the, oh it's, yeah, uh, this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. and she's also having this sort of light source. It's kind of a, oh you know, a okay, very uh, <laughs> almost a proportion of of you know, the, the iPad. Um, 
or like a ta tablet, I should yeah. say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so with color, you can suggest a lot of things uh, just very simply. Um, but I mean, it can, it can be a book, right? So it, yeah, it, it's, it's good to keep things kind of uh, um, dubious. Mm -hmm. uh, but just sort of suggest uh, things, su su suggest ideas. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I believe this, too, this piece is like very it. dubious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the swirl. Of the I would I presume it's moonlight, and I I I love this piece, and I get lost in it, and I could just I could feel the energy of the night, kind of like taking. Yeah, me it's kind of started and... with her scarf in a way. I mean, oh. she's clothes. She's wearing this scarf um, with the figure. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it just sort of starts the scroll. Yeah. Well, if there are any questions, anyone else want to shout out? No? Okay. Thank you so much, Elvira. That was so wonderful to hear about your work. Yeah, of course. And like, we're going to move forward with our next artist, Emily Guy. This is her info. Please check out her website and follow her on Instagram, just like Elvira. Uh, we're going to dive into her artwork right here. And Emily Guy plays with silk and screen printing and installations with single use packaging. Welcome, Emily. Um, as a fellow artist, I've noticed that your works are carefully edited. And I was wondering what really guides you to find the balance and harmony? Yeah, um, thank you so much um, for having me here. And thank you, Elvira, also. Um, for your wonderful, you know, presentation on your work and discussing it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this body of work in particular, a lot of it is about kind of creating a sense of um, kind of a mass of objects and a mess of objects even. Um, but when, and, and most of them are kind of created um, piece by piece in almost kind of like a building process where I'm kind of adding adding these individual elements. I'm really interested in kind of highlighting particularly mundane or kind of unnoticed. Often I'm sourcing like my photographs, I'm taking photographs at, um, uh, you know, from at the dump or at junk stores, thrift stores, and kind of highlighting and bringing those elements together. And for me, that building process is kind of um, really playful and and also like kind of creates um, it's about kind of creating a composition for the work so love to hear that any commentary on this installation mess set yeah um, so I definitely I definitely created this thinking about this particular um, space at counterpulse which is this like beautiful kind of um, ledge that's above the doorway and it's actually kind of a, a, a wide area um, and uh, yeah I mean I was I was thinking a lot about you know counterpulse is a place where people are um, you know where they, there's a lot of performances happening and my work really shifted during the pandemic um, I mean these were themes and, and objects certainly that I was using before but kind of thinking about um, uh, objects as sort of stand-ins for people, particularly objects that were not being used anymore and that were sort of like emptied in space. And the set part of it definitely kind of came out of thinking about Counterpulse as this place where, um, you know, performance is happening and theater and, and dance and, and kind of creating this um, uh, flatness and this um, Two dimensionality that in in a three dimensional space. So that was kind of what I was thinking about. Um, but I really wanted to kind of just you know respond to that space in particular. And um, the most of these pieces and this this kind of shows it's a little bit hard to sort of see. I encourage people if they're able to to come see the work in person because it's a, it's a little bit hard to document up on that ledge. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, they were all works that I had created for other installations. For the most part, I, I, you know, made a few new pieces, but I, when I had installed them previously, they'd sort of almost kind of fit together and kind of made sense and materially and um, I, I guess process wise, they all were sort of from different bodies of work. And the idea here was to kind of mash them all together and almost 
put them into a, a pile, which was a lot of what I was seeing during COVID, um, you know, piles of chairs, tables pushed together that were sort of actually creating barriers um, rather than places that were kind of welcoming or being used for people. All of these pieces of furniture and all of these objects and things that were sort of designed and meant to kind of bring us together were actually, you know, not useful anymore, at least temporarily. And we're, we're um, for me, it was something, it was really interesting to see because I'd always kind of been interested in thinking about, um, you know, functionality and, and especially with something as simple as a chair, kind of taking that function away. It's funny that you mentioned chair because my next question is um, about the, the prominent uh, subject matter of the chair in your work. And is there any uh, representation in your own reality that that represents? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I definitely get asked this question a lot because it's it's this like theme that, you know, comes up again and again in my work. Um, I, I mean, I think probably that one, one early kind of part of it is that I grew up in a house that was like overpacked with stuff and particularly um, my parents, you know, collected a lot of antiques and a lot of, um, a lot of furniture that basically just wasn't being used. And so that was, that was kind of part of, you know, processing the, this idea of something that was so simple as a chair that we don't even really look at or notice, but that kind of in, in its, you know, emptiness of there not being a body can, can actually imply and sort of, uh, uh can sort of, you know, uh, the absence of a body is apparent, I guess, or the absence of a person is apparent. And then mm -hmm. um, it also just for me is like, I'm, you know, I'm interested in like thinking about um, useful things that are rendered useless. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I definitely, this work took on a different meaning during the pandemic. And all of a sudden it was like, the, you know, these, these works I created, you know, pre-pandemic and um, I was definitely working through these themes before, but they took on this kind of different meaning that I really wanted to, you know, fully go into and fully kind of embrace. Um, yeah. um, excellent. Um, when you mentioned um, a useful item, but it's rendered useless, I thought my first thought was we put in work to make something to rest on. Mm. And um, I don't know, I don't know if I could follow that up with any question, but that was just my first initial thought, thinking, you know, we put in, we get the wood, we craft it, we put everything together, we put in the work as humans, and then we are able to like rest at a comfortable height and our body fits ergonomically. And so um, it's, it's interesting to do hear your history with the chair or with certain like random furniture and how they become just kind of like a stockpile and how that uh, relates to your practice now. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think, I think in, you know, in other work that I'm, I'm currently working on, I'm, I'm looking at just generally garbage and waste and, and things that people um, dispose of as a part of it. And yeah. And so for me, that was always like, oh, it's this, you know, like the idea of a pile of chairs, like, you know, there's something so um, emotional about that to me, I guess, like, it feels like it's, it's almost like a, a bunch of people that aren't there together. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been working a lot with, um, you know, different trash and, and like, you know, thinking about the things that people um, use, um, kind of hoard and hold on to or decide that they're they're done with and where that kind of line is. Um, and that's also something that has really like shifted during the pandemic. Um, I do have to note that I think my shirt matches this piece now perfectly. That's great. Just, uh, yeah. I, I think, did you create this shirt for me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's on its way, it's in the mail, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to dive into your initiation on printing on silk um, and how has that process fueled your overall practice? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, as a printmaker, I think that um, 
it was sort of an initial way for me to, I mean, so, some of the works that you were just showing earlier, like for a while I was kind of depicting space. And then the next step for me was kind of creating work that actually lived in space and that actually kind of referenced the architecture of what, what was happening. I mean, I love, I love to kind of like play with space in, in kind of a fun way as much as possible. Um, but something about the kind of flatness um, literally of things that are usually three-dimensional felt like kind of a really, um, it was just like a, a move that was uh, satisfying to me and also had a little bit of humor embedded into it. And that's like something that I, um, yeah, that I definitely enjoy working with. And, and so, you know, as a printmaker, I'll be, this work that you have up here right now actually is um, created digitally, which was also, you know, embracing kind of working with an inkjet printer. That was something that was really new to me. I mostly am a printmaker who's doing kind of everything by hand and cutting and collaging everything by hand. Um, but, you know, kind of embracing different ways of using technology more recently has been, um, has been really, fun and um yeah I mean I so the silk in particular I feel like it has it can it can have a really ghostly kind of um I I really like when uh the translucency and the transparency kind of becomes a part of the idea of the work and kind of the way that it's sitting in space so very recently, actually, I've moved away a little bit from the silk and I'm working with um, just plastic and painter's plastic, really, you know, um, bubble wrap, things that are just um, around and that we're not even really necessarily thinking of as an art making material. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of things that would ordinarily be sort of glossed over and looked over sort of appearing differently in space and sort of like arresting how we might um we might interact with space fantastic um are there any questions for emily there are well i'm gonna you know what, emily i'm gonna kick you off with some comments there's a question hidden in there so first up i'm gonna shout out jason who pointedly said, we can all relate to these pieces of furniture, which I totally felt as well. Um, just hearing you speak about the chair and seeing that repeated over and over again, it feels so, like it just resonates with anyone. And I really love that about your work is it's so accessible because everybody has, you know, there's a chair in everyone, everyone's home at some point. And so that's just a comment. But your um, fellow exhibitor, Elvira, has some comments and a question for you. So I'm gonna read this. I'd love to inhabit your installation. Walk in that door that's displayed on the concrete wall or walk between the chairs and stand next to the broom. Ethereal and present. My perspective is skewed as I look at them. How do you select the perspective to photograph or capture pieces for the work yeah that's that's a big um part of it and it's it's challenging to find the perspective i mean i think a lot of a lot of what i'm doing like in a you know in a work like this is almost kind of trying to create a little bit of a sense of trickery and kind of like a um uh some, something that appears natural in space but isn't actually quite you know, how, how you would expect it. And so, um, I mean, I take, I take a lot of photos carefully measuring out how, you know, how far away I am and then re and, and that's how kind of when I work site specifically, I'm thinking about, okay, at what distance, um, will someone ideally be standing and how is that perspective kind of going to change? Um, but I also, a lot of, you know, I just snap a lot of photos, like visiting places like Urban Ore in Berkeley and, um, you know, different, different junk stores and junkyards and thrift stores, Salvation Army, like all kinds of different places. And so I kind of 
I, I like to have a camera with me whenever possible to just kind of capture things. Um, I think there's something that's also kind of interesting about having these life-size objects, but when, you know, when I installed them at Counterpulse, I mean, I did, you know, bring in a lot of stuff with me, but pretty much all of this work was like rolled onto a single, you know, tube. And it's actually very small and compact and can kind of get folded up um, into a small scale. So, um, but yeah, I, I, it's always challenging to recreate things at the life size scale because it's actually like we, um, you instinctively know how big a cup is or a chair is or a paper bag. Um, and there have been lots of instances where I've, you know, thought that I measured something and, and got the right um, dimensions. And then I, I make a print of it and it's just totally off and you can tell. And um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in pushing that and kind of playing with it, but it's also, um, I mean, I, I think part of it, I, I think I'm moving a little bit more towards um, the abs like abstracting the sort of, uh, you know, not necessarily feeling like I need to exactly represent what's there and sort of pushing the boundaries of, of what feels recognizable. But for, for this work in particular, um, that was a big part of it, wanting, wanting to feel like the perspective and the scale were sort of, um, were going to feel bizarre because they're, you know, they're, they're on, you know, correct and they're right, but everything else that's happening is, is strange and kind of um, unfamiliar. I have one more question for you. You may have touched upon it a little bit, but I'm going to um, shout it out and also welcome Justin to unmute themselves if they so feel that. Let me just start off. Um, Justin commented, I sense a choreography of play and improvisation of objects in your work. Do you feel like the chairs and objects in your work are embodying new life and new meaning devoid of humans? Yeah, um, I mean, that's really interesting. I feel like be because of my um, like personal history, because of my background, I'm really like sensitive and interested in objects and, and in things and materials. And um, I, uh, yeah, I really like the idea of kind of spotlighting or highlighting single objects that otherwise, you know, are on their way to the trash or have, you know, um, thinking about kind of the layers of history of different things that have kind of been um, forgotten or, or, um, or are not, are not being used anymore. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that that exactly answers the question, but I, I, I think, you know, thinking about the emotions and kind of um, the range of emotions that, that people can feel about objects and space and, and trash in particular is, um, is really interesting to me. And, you know, the way, the different ways that we engage with objects. Um, Um, before Thank we, you. sorry, <laughs> thank you for answering all the beautiful questions that people have asked. Um, I wanted to ask you real fast, uh, out of, just for fun, did you go to a thrift town in El Sobrani before they closed? I did, yes. I was really <laughs> sad when they closed. That was a place that was like on my commute to um, Crockett, but yeah, that was yeah. Like, that was um, that's like, basically around the area that I grew up and I like I would go to thrift town all the time so I'm glad to yeah. hear that that was definitely a place and uh, I'm sure a, a source of inspiration yes, for right. all your works and um, also congratulations on your MFA thesis show at BAMFA uh, do you want to give a little information on that yeah sure so I, I have work up um right now at the Berkeley Art Museum um and uh, the museum is opened uh, on weekends, basically, and you have to reserve an advance ticket. Um, but um, yeah, it's a great show. It's a it's a group show with uh, my work is in it with the rest of my cohort who are incredible, very, very amazing artists. And there's also 
just really great work up um, at Banffa right now. So I would highly recommend going. And it closes um, July 11th, I'm pretty sure. So there's plenty of time to go see it. All right, you hear it here, folks. You go, gotta go to Berkeley, go see some <laughs> art, go see Emily's pieces and all the amazing artwork uh, from the MFA program at Berkeley. Um, and I wanted to give one more chance for any more questions for Emily. Okay, and we are nearing the end. I want to remind everyone that this exhibition is available online at our virtual Art and Neighborhoods uh, Gallery, which you can inquire about purchasing the artwork and you can look at the other artworks that are uh, being exhibited around San Francisco right now, including uh, Ritual, Kamaika, and City Hall. There will be new exhibitions coming soon. Uh, we'll be installing and deinstalling next week. I'll be very busy next week, so I'm very excited for that. Um, and now I want to open up the floor to, um, to a nice Q&A portion uh, and other just thoughts and compliments that you want to give the artist to anyone, if anyone feels like they're bold enough. Sorry, I'm multitasking, trying to get <laughs> no worries. Elvira spotlighted here, but I did have a comment and it's just, you know, and you can hear a dog, so I apologize, <laughs> of course, right when I'm speaking. Um, I'm, you know, I really wish that and I hope to experience your works in person and I highly recommend everybody reach out to Counterpulse and try to book that because I feel like both of them, as with many artworks, you know, it's something else to really just feel them and sit with them and reflect on them when you're there in the room with the piece and hearing each of you speak about your work and elaborate on your inspirations and what's going on, the color palettes, the subject matter just adds so much of another inspirational like layer to it that it it just it draws me in and that's why I love these receptions be they virtual or eventually in person and so um thank you for giving us that insight into your work and you know thanks for sharing with us and thank you Justin for giving the um counterpulse perspective and just telling us about why these pieces and why they work so well within the room yeah, I, I want to thank also Artspan and, and Counterpulse for the opportunity to show work there. It's amazing. Uh, as, as I <clears throat> had uh, my work there, I, I also went to the video installations that were there at that moment. I think they're deinstalled. <clears throat> it's just amazing work. I mean, yeah, I was blown away. So yeah, so the Counterpulse is, is this great um, anchor cultural, yeah. Um, any final words from Justin uh, about Counterpulse and? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that people were able to see the works um, in person and will continue to do so. It's been really inspiring to have live audiences, see them come out look at the mess set and then, you know, at varying levels as well, as well as uh, Elvira's work and like really just appreciating how people pause and look at the works as they're um, entering and exiting other performative spaces and just like, yeah, I mean, I, I think just uh, I'm, I'm th this partnership has allowed to really blur the, the, the lines between performance and visual arts and like incorporating the two in a way that like I think is, you know, should be the, the future partnership should continue to allow that's um, it's been really great. Yeah, we definitely look forward to continue to bridging our creative efforts and elevating all types of art within San Francisco. So we are very proud to be partnered with Counterpulse. Um, okay, any last thoughts, questions, concerns, compliments from the crowd? We always welcome compliments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, I like your shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Good old Carrie <laughs> Lane. Remember, <laughs> Paul's coming in hot with the compliments. I love I, it. I have one last thought on Emily's, Emily's work. Um, I kind of nags me, I need to say it. Uh, you know, I feel like in your uh, collages, like that, that the silk screens, right? Um, these chairs that you pick out or, the, you know, objects from the, the unsung, they're almost like unsung heroes, right? 
and of, of this sort of play that you're writing. <laughs> it's just a comment <laughs> and it occurred to me there because you, you were right, like you were describing. I mean, there's there's a light there. It's very theatrical, right? Like you um, the sort of layering and, and the screening and kind of like the glass show. How it, I don't know, there's a stage almost for these things. Yeah, definitely. Thanks it's for all. the comment. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, it was really liberating actually to mush all of those things together in, you know, in that space. And I'm not sure that I would have done it without, um, without seeing that that space at Counterpulse and thinking about the relationship between COVID and and what's happening at different, you know, spaces where people gather um, right now. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm really sad, Elvira. I haven't been able to see your work in person because I think it wasn't up um, when I was there. But I'm so looking forward to seeing it. And um, yeah, so, so, sometimes it's good to, to be late. <laughs> in my case, because <laughs> I had to postpone the installation, <laughs> so I got to see your work. And Justin has noted that he is available for docent tours. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, It'll most well, likely be, oh, sorry, go for it. No, go ahead. Oh, just, just saying it'll most likely be me letting folks into the building and um, into the gallery space. Cool. <clears throat> um, I would love Thank to give- Thank you for a, doing that. Yeah. I'd love to give a toast to the artists and to Justin from Counterpulse, hearing about your work and, um, and, uh, and everything really connects me to your practice and how you make and, and more importantly why you make and I really appreciate all that you do so cheers to you all thank you so much thank you thank you